Um, I didn't start uh, a career as a curator. I studied fine art and art history. Um, and towards the end of the degree, I, I kind of stopped making work. And I didn't really know what a curator is or does. Um, but I was at the, at the time organising exhibitions of friends' work that were on the course with me. Um, and I had left, I studied at Manchester Met Art School. Um, and I was invited by a project space in Manchester to curate, to organise an exhibition. And they were below an architect's office. And I was very interested that I had to walk through the architect's office to get to the project space. So my response to all this was to curate something for uh, the office and not for the project space. And the architects happily agreed. And so what I did is I asked uh, a grown, I think 70 artists from around the world to make work using poster notes. So I would post them the poster notes and they would post it back to me. And all the address labels and everything was exhibited together with the poster notes. And these were dotted in and around the office on the computer screens and the uh, telephones. And this is a scan, I think this is by Jonathan Monk. It's a work by Norman Spina. Um, and I was fortunate, I moved out to London sort of a year after doing the project in Manchester, and I was fortuitous enough to be invited by Jens Hoffman, who was director of the Institute of Contemporary Arts, to stage the show there, and invited uh, kind of another 30 artists, I think there's 100 in total. Um, and again, it kind of followed the same premise that they were exhibited in areas that we wouldn't sort of classify as exhibition spaces. So the, the ICA were exhibited in the foyer, in the bookshop, um, in the bar. That's in the front doors. Uh, and it was kind of quite easy to put together and use um, and go into this little suitcase and it subsequently toured to a, a venue in, in Minneapolis as well and it kind of evolved as it, as it went on. I was interested in making something that wasn't static, that had its own life and I worked on it for about three or four years and it travelled around the world and me with it. Um, at this point, I was freelance, so I'd be curating exhibitions and, and writing as well. Um, and I kind of started to think about why and how exhibitions are paint, uh, presented within context of art galleries and thinking about sort of um, orthodox channels that define what exhibitions are. And I was thinking very orthodoxly about where shows could take place. And a friend of mine was going on a, a, a conference that happened on the Trans-Siberian train and I thought it was a great opportunity to stage an exhibition on the, the train and invite artists to make work, um, thinking about that as a, as a context for presentation. Um, and it kind of like circulated a little bit around the old like myth and rumour. I used an announcement service called uh, Eflux, which museums and institutions use um, to, to basically announce press releases to inform people about their exhibitions as a pay for service, so I had to, and it's relatively expensive, so I had to save up and, um, and pay for it. But it's one way of me telling people about the exhibition that it existed, and it almost became part of the exhibition because, as you agreed, it may be or may not imagine what an exhibition would look like on a, on a train. Um, this is a work by a Berlin-based artist called Kirsten Peroff, where she had got the train. She's interested that the Trans-Siberian train covers a certain amount of distance, but what does the, the train conductor cover on the, on the same, traveling along on the same train? So the piece by Gabriel Curry, who's a Mexican artist, where we've got uh, bought the meal and put a note saying that someone had to leave and we were kind of interested in what, how people would react to it and if they would take it or not. And going to quickly go through uh, Roman on Dap, who had a large show there, the team of the money built this kind of minuscule model, model of the state model. 
Um, and he lives on a street in Slavki called Siberian Street. We had these business cards handed out on the train and stop. So I was just called Matthew, who made a, a poem that was distributed throughout the train. So again, thinking along the lines of where shows to take place in sort of unexpected locations, this is an exhibition I did. I was invited by a commercial company called School Gallery uh, to think of something for their summer show. Um, and as opposed to presenting work within the gallery space, what I did is I asked artists to make work as on poster format that was subsequently displayed on gallery shutters in and around London. And you can walk into this gallery and get a map so you could actually go around the galleries and see them when the galleries were, were closed. But I was also interested in, as well, as well as kind of meeting an unexpected audience that was sort of everyday passers by that these artworks would, would meet. Um, so the work by an artist called Jonathan Monkham, the shoots of the Listen Gallery. Rube Milishwanga, Stephen Friedman. You related back, back, back to your practice here about the unexpected audience. Do, do I think about it? Yeah, I'm conscious yeah. about it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. About. I mean, the, these, these, the main thing I'm going to speak about is the projects I've done independently, how they fed into the thinking here. Um, but one thing I'm very conscious of is how. Um, how art meets a broad, broad public, like similar to the posters that were, that were meeting as many people as, as possible, and then the exhibition was very much about that yeah. amazing thing. But by putting it in those kind of very public places, yeah. unusual, perhaps, you know, people are just going to them and yeah. not even realise that they are works of yeah, art. Yeah, they might not register like them as challenging art. them as works of art by doing that. Do you think? I guess the, yeah, the artists were the, the show was was very much about it may or may not be art, and the, the artists had to take that into consideration. You know, the idea that not only they were on poster format, but that they were displayed on gallery shutters. Um, it, the show then went on to to Paris, where I was living for two years, working for this place in the picture called Cadiz Star Foundation, which is a private art foundation that holds I think about four thousand works by contemporary artists that's grown and they've opened a, a new place in San Francisco, and the show kind of followed a, a similar logic. That was a map given to an audience that could go around and see works by night. This is an exhibition, the first show that I created for Gallery Star Foundation called Sometime Waiting. Um, and I was interested in playing this format of the group exhibition and the solo exhibition in kind of, um, It was a big group exhibition but the, the presentation of the show changed and evolved so works of art were kind of coming and going in the gallery. Um, and this is a solo exhibition by an LA artist called Mungo Thompson that played with this kind of notion of, of waiting a little bit and anticipation. As in, it then closed, that was open for two weeks and it closed for two weeks as we um, installed the group show inside and then work by Pierre Business was put in place in the old piece. Postcard piece by an artist called uh, Dan Rees, where he sandwiches two postcards together and puts two different addresses on them and posts them. So it's up to the postman which where they get to. Uh, this is an exhibition that I did for a gallery in Paris, not Cadiz kind of Art Foundation. It's called Yvonne Lambert. I was invited by an artist called Jonathan Monk to to make something alongside a solo exhibition by him. Um, I was very interested in Jonathan's work for, for many years and I did a show that was about him but without him. 
So I managed to find artists, uh, works by artists that have somehow used his work or referred to his work. Um, for example, this is a passport photograph by an artist called Ryan Gander wearing uh, an edition by Jonathan Monk. This is a series of works by the artist Jonathan Monk, um, which is called Waiting for Famous People, and an artist called Olivia Babbin and a photoshopped out the, I think it was Andy Warhol who was holding up, and an artist had photoshopped out and put his own name on there, so kind of playing a little bit with the notion of authorship. And the show had kind of evolved as well, and it was that the Paris edition took place in 2009, and this is another version of the show, 2012, for a gallery in Brussels, where the same works are exhibited together with works from the collection of Jonathan Monk. Found a loop as well to famous artists from San Francisco. by an artist, uh, Pierre Bismuth, who had the Neon piece in another show, um, which is a series of works which are called This Is To Certify This Is Not A Work By, and he has an artist sign it. Uh, this is a project I did called The Store, I was invited by uh, an art fair um, called Artissima, <coughs> in Turin. Um, to come up with a uh, project for the art fair. So I was thinking about the idea of the art fair and commerce and the art market. And, um, and what I had done is <coughs> organised a project which had large editions by very well-known artists that were available to purchase uh, by the public for relatively low cost or even taken away for free. So it was kind of inverting the, the principle of the art market where it was sold for relatively high prices. So it was a bit like a, it was an exhibition as a, as a shop. And it's uh, worked together with an architect as well, the purpose-built structure. And it had its own doors and played on the, the sort of visual language of shops by having opening hours on the doors declared and that CCTV. And did, did you end up with a dialogue with it? artists about giving their work away? Yeah, well, they, they made, made work specifically for the framework of the show, yeah, so they made work in, in large edition numbers. But there was work by Claire Fontaine, I was playing on a work by Phyllis Gonzalez Torres, which is a stack pile of posters that can be taken away for free. Oh, no. But I worked together with um, Illy Coffee as well. We were one of the main sponsors of the art fair. They commission artists and have done for the past 30 years um, for artists to make espresso cups. So we showed this sort of um, on the collection and they were available to purchase. Uh, can I just ask a yeah. question about, about the post it note one? Yeah, the post it note one. I was just wondering. You know, they're, 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 they're borderline on art, aren't they? They're, they're just right on the edge. You put them around the office. Um, yeah. I mean, did you have, were there instances where they were removed and thrown away? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was. Someone yeah, else was, with a telephone number on them? Yeah, there was that all sort of, yeah, especially the, uh, the ICA, which have mm. a very large uh, audience. I have quite a few of them were stolen and damaged, and, but most of them weren't. I think people are relatively respectful. But none of them have um, insurance values or, yeah. So the artists knew as well, you know, that the idea of where they presented was fundamental to the show. So that they weren't presented within gallery spaces that were exhibited on, in non-exhibition areas. There's some more views of the so I did a sort of store in the store, it's called the record store, where I got music uh, by artists where you could sort of try it before you buy. Uh, this is a mini project with Billy Coffee. Uh, this was 2000 and then 
Oh yeah. This is uh, a show I did for Gallery in Naples. Um, that were keen on working me. And uh, all the artists in the that participated in the exhibition were aliases of other artists. So there were living artists working under different names. Um, and the whole thing was um, a lie. So I wrote the press release as if these artists had gone missing or lost or fell out of the art world for some reason or another or stopped making art. Um, and each had a sort of story to tell. But I had to continue on this lie to the people I owned the gallery. And it, and it kind of, it, it really worked because I, I think they had uh, sold four works to major museums. So they were living artists working the different artists name and kind of no biography to it. So the show spoke a lot about um, biography and authorship and truth and false and fact and fiction. Um, this was for Gallery and Shirin and it was kind of like a survey of works by artists and how they've used commercial gallery galleries as media within their works in various ways. Um, for example, this is a piece by an artist collective who were based in London called Bank. Um, and during the 90s they would do this project called Facts Back, where they would get hold of press releases from galleries and correct them uh, for the grammar mistakes and spelling mistakes and fax them back to the galleries themselves and it had damaged quite a lot of people, but I think they're, they're great. They, Take all the limitations and all the corrections, and they would stamp them saying this has been corrected by bank services. This is a piece uh, by an artist called Adam McHugh that was displayed at the front near the window of the gallery. This is by Edward Williams, which is a fictitious gallery called Rupert Fetlock. Um, it's an amazing sculpture piece which has these sort of silhouettes dancing and the music to um, hard techno music. Um, this is kind of like an archive room of invitation cards and press releases of how of projects done by artists around the world that have used the commercial gallery somehow as a medium. Invited by a gallery in Rome to organise the show. Um, I'm from Chester, um, and I was thinking about if Chester. Ryan Gander um, is an artist that worked with um, a number of occasions. There's a close friend who's also from Chester, and we've had this sort of joke between us of if Chester could actually be a thing, if it could be put on the map in the in the art world. So this gallery invited me. From Rome with Chester with its Roman origins, I thought it'd be nice to do something about Chester in Rome and tell the Romans a little bit about their own history. So the show exhibited works by artists that were born in Chester, but I think almost all of them have lived elsewhere in London and Berlin, um, together with a sort of like historical section which comprised uh, the artifacts and documents and images um, about uh, Chester. The Roman past. Um, there's an artist called Jesse Wine as well, which I organised an exhibition or solo exhibition in Gallery 6. This is a show that I did when I think it's the first year I joined here. I was, I was thinking about sort of how art is, is mediated um, and unpacked towards a, a public. Um, I became very interested in signage, and I think that what kind of punctuates the exhibitions and the, the work that I do is sort of like a strong graphic element and taking into consideration how um, the sort of stage set is developed and how that um, mediates the artworks and view and brings everything together and creates a sort of environment that a particular experience is, is given over. Um, and I was thinking about sort of like wall labels um, and how they're traditionally written by a, a curator and I was thinking about if I didn't write them and someone else did um, and the show was looked through the lens of 
somebody that was an associate with the art world at all. So I worked together with a real life detective who on the installation of the exhibition had come around and, and kind of tried to uh, decipher how the works are made and what the meaning, particular meaning of them were and at least um, treated them like the scenes of, of, of a crime and wrote these case reports that were subsequently displayed next to the works themselves. Um, it was, uh, the detective was a guy called Alfred Roos, who's quite famous for bringing down the Austrian government um, in the late 80s. He was a bit of a celebrity and was really happy to work on this exhibition and presenting this. Uh, <coughs> This is like a description of the exhibition before you went in. And there's all the sorts of graphic elements picked on that try to stress all the visual language of um, detective work like crime scene reports and had also the biography of the of the detective on view. Don't think I have I've got any images of the show itself. This is a probably the largest exhibition I've curated today for a museum called Castillo de Rivoli, which is sort of the equivalent of the Tate Modern in Italy. Um, and I did a site visit to the museum, um, and the show was set to take place in what's called the Manicomonga, which is seen as translation as the, the long sleeve, and I was particularly struck by how long it was in relation to, it was relatively not so wide, um, and the exit was also the entrance. Um, so for this exhibition, what I have done is the whole wing is split up to uh, two galleries of equal sizing, and each of these two galleries was a, two separate sets of artists. Um, and the show displayed I mainly select the works that were done as pairs or, or in, in series and display them over the two galleries. So it's making a sort of spot difference. So you'd have to get to the second room, go back to the first to sort of detect the differences and nuances between the, the two exhibitions. But it's a lot to do with slowing down viewing and sort of meddling a little bit with the viewer's path or one that is traditionally taken, which is kind of from A to B, and this is kind of about going from A to B and back to A again, and vice versa. Um, I also included work from the museum's collection, this the top piece is by Lawrence Wheeler, um, Ian Wallace, which is a series of paintings that he done of exhibitions in museums around the world. Uh, it's a book piece by Claire Fontaine. This is a piece by Jonathan Monk, which is called Separated, which kind of underlined the whole idea of the show, where he had took, found uh, vintage photographs of couples and <coughs> tore them in two and had them framed separately. And they were displayed over the, the two rooms. Uh, it's a postcard piece by Alvahiro Guetti, who in later life had worked a lot about doubling and symmetry. Um, there was this was I think a series of ten and I showed two of them. This is really where you can see the what was that play? There's one room and they can play the other side. <coughs> uh, this in the foreground is by a day shot called Nina Bayer, where she had produced her sculpture and subsequently destroyed it and spoken from memory over the phone to two actresses about the object and the sort of formal qualities and they had to make it based on the verbal description. You can see it's completely not really different even though they were following the same set of instructions. Uh, it's Andy Warhol. A little known artist. <laughs> and I've kind of played with the idea, although there was kind of a symmetry happening, I played inside and it kind of like an inverted symmetry as well. So, for example, that's a piece by an artist called Louise Gawler, who for the past 50 years has photographed work by other artists. 
Um, and although that she's the author of that work, that's the photograph of the work by Andy Warhol. And um, it's right next to the work by Andy Warhol. So in the other room was another version. So the show sort of spoke about how artists make work in series as well. Um, kind of different iterations based on the same idea. This is the first exhibition I organised for Moston. So that question you asked about, um, am I conscious about the, the audience? I mean, here, that I believe context has kind of informed the work. So whether it be uh, Castillo Derivoli, that show I just spoke about, which is very much about um, looking at the architect architectural people particularities of the space and addressing those and about the Italian art history and philosophy which is a lot to do with doubling and symmetry as kind of thinking about here as a location um, and also that I was fortunate enough to have a year of working ahead on the exhibition program so I was able to think kind of far down the line and what I wanted to do is sort of conceptualise uh, the program is not due to shows, but it shows safe. Um, so dealing with the program into two strands, and one of which was curating exhibitions or organising exhibitions based on popular themes, and the other was about looking at the history of the building here and using it as, as inspiration and ingredients for, for making shows. Um, so this show, uh, you present work by five artists. Um, and it was, with, the, with, with it being the first show in the new program, I wanted to, make, to do something that was kind of inviting and um, a bit of a change. So this exhibition, all, all the works could be interacted with um, in, in, in some capacity. So for example, this is a piece by Felix Gonzalez Torres, which is part of his candy piles. Where you take the, the candy and the curator may or may not decide to replenish them. Um, did everyone see this? Mm -hmm. It's a work by Vivian Norwich Fonda, um, where she had got hold of these vintage typewriters and substituted the letters for dots and commas. So as you were typing, you were kind of making a, another language, and when you complete the sheet, you add it to this ever growing display. <coughs> And as well as looking sort of outside the visual arts as well, I became very interested in including things that were kind of non-objects, so picking up a little bit about the, the Chester show I showed you and the detective show about including things that are not art per se, but have something to do with the ideas contained within the exhibition. So I worked at the University of Bangor, um, the psychology department about how we look and how we think. And the show is a lot to do with that, about how we Interact with objects. And this is by Yeppy Hayden, which is a kind of viewfinder where you look at it and everything on the other side would be turned upside down. And then you front ones, which is it's not, that's how it started life. There's a, a wooden box contained the kind of small wooden toys which were used by the public. I think, you know, the measure of success is how people sort of engage in the show. I think it's relatively successful. Um, as well as probably in the, the downstairs gallery spaces as well, I was particularly keen on running a program of young and emerging artists, and that was, was based in, in Gallery 6. Um, this is the first exhibition by a young artist called Alico, Italian artist. Uh, just going back to what I was saying about how the, the program was dealing with two strands, one of which was organising exhibitions based on popular themes and the other um, about the history of the building. This is a show I did about portraiture. I was thinking very much along the lines of when people think about how they might learn this and think about portraiture. So I was thinking about how to do a show about portraiture in a, in a different way or show the, the genre in a new light. Um, and so, included work by, I'm see several artists. 
and um, invited all the people in the pitches to write a response back to the work. So you got to sort of behind the scenes take of the sitter. Um, here's an example. This is a painting by Elizabeth Payton of the artist Olafra Eliasson, who gladly agreed to write the response. And the responses were displayed next to the works so on pieces of paper. The piece by Wolfgang Tillman um, of some of called Princess Julia is written response back to it. Uh, this is by Jerry Lindman, a photograph of Ed Roche. This one I'm particularly most proud of is just what you said before about getting in touch with people that do respond. I was, yeah, because I'm a huge Ed Roche fan. That's uh, a work by an artist called Loris Rialt, French artist, and it's a photograph of Lee Ronaldo in, I forget, I don't know, a chamber, where, which kind of cancels out noise. Um, that again was some, something I was really happy to be in touch with. He's a guitarist out of a band called Sonic Youth. I was actually really shocked when I got the email. Was was a little shocked. With the last thing, yeah. Gallery One, um, a German photographer called Nettie Kell. Um, I say photographer, but she's not. She prefers to be known as an artist. She uses photography yeah, as, a, as, a, as a medium. I don't know if you saw that. This is a show that I curated together with Alfredo, uh, Italian artist, Frank Bacari, that was coming through a period of rediscovery. Um, uh, the various industries, photo booths. Uh, again, well, just going back to what I was saying about the, the sort of the things that were in the program of the popular scenes, this is a show I did um, about landscape and about biography and how that informs artists' work. Um, I, so for this show, uh, there was artists including the presenting works to do with where they uh, were born. So it's sort of like a journey around the UK through artists' eyes. Tracy Evan, the film about Margate. Um, so again, like a lot of exhibitions I've done before, I work closely with the to kind of create the, the stage set to the, the, the experience. Um, and the side is just spoke about the work of the artists in general and moved into further detail about the work exhibited. That is accompanied by sort of historical facts and population size of the town being addressed in the work of art, and that's in this case Mahogany. <coughs> Share is the fruit to Rome, a singing art of Rome, having one of the largest population sizes in Europe, and things and that was kind of the opposite. So, thinking about size and scale. Um, became very conscious of seeing like a lot of exhibitions and going to a lot of art fairs and um, that size becoming an issue, this idea of spectacle and experience and public artworks um, I kind of have a bit of a problem with, with that. So doing this exhibition I brought together works of art however exceptionally small. I asked a lot of artists who are known for making large work to make very small work for this show. This is by Amanda Rosso, who's based in LA, who makes these oversized uh, t-shirts and trousers and for this exhibition. She made a very small t-shirt. And in the same way, this is by Brent Warden, who's based in Berlin, who does these huge tapestries. It's made by this very small version. Um, ah, yeah. So, what time are we on? Just on two, so... Okay. Well, I'm going to speak a little bit about the history <coughs> of the um, 
So these are the things I kind of got my head when I had to be invited to do an exhibition. I was thinking about something for me. Um, there's the consideration of relevance from an exhibition idea, questions it poses in relation to context, who's it speaking to, for what purpose, and then moving on to what casts, so as in what artwork, artists and artworks and content will be contained within the exhibition and how it will be presented and made visible on the stage of the exhibition. Um, the answer is. Pardon? The answer is. <laughs> Well, these are, these are things that I kind of have a self manifesto, so I'm thinking about these things when either I'm thinking of a show here or I'm doing something for outside. So the answer of the show is themselves, whether I've been successful in kind of meeting my criteria is another thing, but there's something that um, in the form of what I think, how I think, and what I deliver. So when I joined here, um, here as a, as a child and always kind of curious about the building and the Victorian architecture and when applying for the job I read the sort of month, the about section and learned that it was built for um, it wasn't built with recent it wasn't built for the Gwyneth Ladies Art Society but they were the, one of the first people to use the building um, and as I read the this document and then doing some further research and finding another usage of the building, I was thinking these are the ingredients to make um, a series of shows. But around this time, I kind of grew a bit of a fatigue towards uh, exhibitions of contemporary art and was kind of much more fond of um, the experience found in sort of natural history museums or museums of, of culture and sort of particular environments. There's lots of signage and it would have quite a big informative experience I was interested in what would happen if you sort of mix together uh, works by contemporary artists with historical artifacts and documents and thinking very much about how to work with the community um, and by being self-reflexive is to kind of have a, maybe a greater appeal, more of an impact, have people feel a little bit more ownership over uh, the exhibitions that we do. This is the first show that we did called Women's Art Society that looked at Lady Augusta Mostyn and the Mostyn family. Um, and the Ladies Art Society have managed to loan these catalogues for the library in Aberystwyth, um, which were produced for the first exhibitions that they had here. Um, and I was looking at sort of issues around the time, a lot of gender politics um, that underpinned the formation of the Women's Ladies Art Society who we were allowed to join other art societies on the basis of, of gender. Um, so it included a lot of artists that spoke about this theory, for example, Martha Rosler. Um, there's a work by an artist called Marich Algen Ringberg, which is a collection of objects that defines uh, natural borders of things that we're not allowed to take through and pass through a country. Um, this series of works by IYY, which uh, is his middle finger up to iconic um, buildings, so it's sort of an anti-establishment that ran throughout the, the formation of the Ladies Art Society themselves. Um, oh yes, when I joined here I was really aware that there was uh, a lack of signage and kind of mediation material um, that was available as kind of photocopied sheets so I wanted to sort of raise the quality of um, signage and produce these little sort of Exhibition catalogues, the more with exhibition guides, um, give kind of further information. Um, uh, yeah. I was interested in the previous occupation where most of it developed into in 2010, used to be a role in our sorting office. Um, so I was thinking that there was lots and offer there. I was saying about love of sort of early conceptual art and a lot of artists use the mail service to generate the production of their, their artwork. Um, so these, this was one of three shows that we've done. Um, for this one, I worked quite closely with the Royal Mail Museum and managed to secure some loans of objects and artifacts and went for the image archive. This is a work by an artist called Robert Barry, which is called The Invitation Piece. He made it in 1972 where he worked with all the galleries that represented it 
him at the time and got them to declare an exhibition by him at another gallery. So it was kind of sending you on this merry-go-round, merry-go-round around the world. It was in fact no exhibition. The exhibition was the imitation cards that mailed out mainly this. Do you have any questions at this point? Any thoughts? Um, I was wondering about what the breakdown of your time is, how much time you spend, you know, different sort of parts of your research and actually here for your exhibitions. Um, I'm constantly four days a week here. Mm -hmm. So I spend four days a week working. On site here? Yeah. Doing what? Doing what? Yeah. <laughs> um, contacting artists a lot, yeah. administration. So a lot sitting up the doing writing emails a lot. Writing emails, doing a lot of loan forms, organising shipping, uh, speaking to conservationists, uh, speaking to galleries, speaking to private collections, speaking to artists. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot of internal stuff as well. I think yeah, it's communicating to the engagement team what it is that yeah. the, the working together the theory the behind it all, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The war two show, I think you yeah. 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 Which I think is the thing that most artists have been involved is here. Yeah, a real visual piece. Yeah. Uh, so you can really hit the nail on the head with what they're thinking about this dialogue that can emerge between presenting things from the past with things from the present. Did it show the feedback? The, it from did, the public? Yeah, 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 the attendance. Uh, uh, right up, yeah. We really did how you measure feedback. <laughs> With more that's of attendance. That's, that's one of the things that we measure feedback with. Yeah, there's a lot of sustained um, repeated visits as well by people. That's one way of measuring. I think it's very difficult to measure a success of an exhibition. Mm -hmm. I always say there's an um, a, a exhibition called When Attitudes Become Form, which was staged at the Kunst Hall Burn in 1972. Uh, there's been many books written about it and exhibitions based on that exhibition and conferences and everything. Um, and it's a real sort of pinnacle moment in our history, but only a few thousand people had seen the exhibition. So I think I think measuring an exhibition success it's not necessarily equated with how many people attend it. But it's one of the ways it could, could be evaluated.